Gracious Father, we are so grateful for Zach and his ministry here at Foster. We are grateful for everything he does, from young adults to children's ministries. He wears many hats, and one of them is preaching. And we pray today, Lord, that as he speaks to us, your Holy Spirit would anoint him too, like the Cox family, that he would share your word with us. Be with us now as we hear from you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I'd like to thank Roger Clark and his praise band. I, I love it. I love all of our praise bands here, but Roger Clark reminds me why I live in the South and why I chose to move to North Carolina. I mean, those are the, those are the reasons right there. We just sang all those songs. I love it. Um, unless we see God, we cannot worship him. Unless we see God, we cannot worship him. I, um, every summer, take a trip to the beach in Florida. I've done it every summer for my entire life. I've never missed a single summer. I've missed days within that week, but I always go to the beach for a week in the summer with my mom's side of the family. And it's a fun time. It's in July. It usually is around July 4 week so that we can shoot off fireworks and watch the whole beach light up with fireworks. And then another reason why we pick it in July is we have four birthdays in the family on, in July. And so we lump it all together, and one of our lunches when we're there at the beach, we do a big birthday celebration for all four July birthdays. And it's my dad, my cousin, my cousin's son, and my uncle's wife. So there's four people that have their birthdays. But there's about 11 of us that it's not our birthday, okay, that are also there. And so we throw this big birthday party, and my grandma gets a cake, and everybody's name is written on the cake, and it's got those four names, and they all huddle around the candles, and we pick an age randomly and put that number of candles in, usually the youngest, so that we don't have a, as big a fire on the cake. Uh, and, and then we, we watch them all try and blow it out, and then it's time for grandma to give out the birthday cards. And so grandma comes out of her room, and if you watch her, carefully, usually we're not paying much attention, but if you do pay attention, she comes out with a large stack of cards, but it's only four people's birthday. And then she sets that large stack on the table, and she gets the four birthday cards, and she gives the four birthday cards to everybody whose birthday it is that day. Not that day, that month. And they all open their cards, and they thank Grandma because Grandma's very generous, and in that card there's some sort of money. It's usually in a $100 bill. And they all have the same amount of money in their card, no matter whether they're one or they're 60. It doesn't matter. They get the same amount of money. But the craziest part to me about this, this birthday celebration is what happens about five minutes later. When Grandma goes back to the table and she gets the stack of the rest of the cards, the rest of the cards are for everybody else whose birthday it is not. And she walks around the room and gives us all a card with our name on it. And we all open the card, and inside the card is the exact same $100 bill that all the birthday people get. Amen. Yeah, right? Amen. I'm hoping my grandma doesn't watch this today because I don't want her to get the idea that I don't like this idea. I love it, Grandma. If you're watching, I love it. Keep, keep it up. It's a good idea. But it blows my mind. I, 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 every time it happens, I think to myself, I'm glad I, my birthday is not in July or I would be angry about this idea. <laughs> Why would I be angry about this idea? Because when my birthday comes around in November, I get a card in the mail with a $100 bill in it from my grandma, right? So I just, I doubled up in a sense. It's not everybody's birthday, but in my mind, I'm like, I'm getting double what my, co my cousin didn't get two cards just now. And he gets the same amount. I watch. Don't worry. I watch. It's not like he gets $200. It's the same amount, okay? And it's the same amount for my dad. And I'm like, this, they, and everyone's so gracious. And thank you, Grandma. And I'm sitting there going, do you guys know what's happening? Do you, are you guys seeing this? You're getting gypped. That's what's happening. You're getting gypped. And everybody gets what Paxton got a card this year. With a $100 bill, I'm like, well, this is a reason to have more kids. We're, I mean, he, Paxton doesn't know he got a $100 bill. He just got one. <laughs> and it paid for the gas to get to the trip. And it's not like my grandma owes us any kind of gift at this week. She pays for the condos that we stay in. 
She rents us each, uh, each of our families one. So there's three different condos in this complex for a week. She's already spent all this money to give us this vacation. She provides us lunch every day. And then she gives us these cards. And everybody gets a card. It doesn't matter whether it's your birthday or not. Jesus tells a story in Matthew 20 that's pretty similar to this. He tells a story. He says that the kingdom of heaven is like a master, a landowner who goes out early in the morning and he hires laborers to work in his vineyard. And so he goes out, I imagine, early in the morning to like labor pool. Do you know what labor pool is? I discovered this in high school when I used to work with homeless ministries. And I was like, what? There's a place where I can just take these guys and they can get jobs? And so I would just put them all in my dad's suburban and I would take them all to labor pool and drop them off and be like, I felt good. I provided them with, with work, you know. And then I realized what labor pool really was. It was like, maybe they would get a job. And if they got a job, it was going to pay them pretty much whatever the very bare minimum was. And it wasn't going to be something they could live off of. And I imagine that that's the kind of place that Jesus was trying to describe in this parable as at, that, they, that they went, he went to this place to hire some day laborers, Right? And so these guys are used to working for, you know, not, not the best pay, right? And, and so he hires these, these workers early in the morning, and he offers them the wage of a denarius a day, which is the same wage as a Roman soldier of that time. So this was, this was a good pay. They were excited about getting this kind of pay. A Roman soldier's pay, that's, that's good for just working in the vineyard. So they were excited, and they, and they went to the vineyard, and they start working. And then the master goes and, and hires more at 9 o'clock and, and brings them over and gets them started working. And then he goes back again at noon and hires more. And I guess he just needed more workers because <laughs> he goes out again at 3 and hires more people. And then at 5, and I'm not sure when this work day ends because... He hires some at five, <laughs> and I, I'm guessing maybe it's a seven to seven. It's a 12-hour shift, uh, so he got those workers for two hours. And at the end of the shift, at the end of the day, he's paying his workers, and what does he do? You know the story. It's the last ones hired. They're, they're called up, and they're given the same pay, that Roman soldier's day wage. That's a lot of money. For two hours of work, maybe. We don't know when the day ended. Maybe it ended at 5.30 and it was only a half an hour work for them. <laughs> they get paid that same amount. And then the ones that were hired at 5 get paid that same amount. And the ones hired at 3 and those that hired at noon and those hired at 9, they're given that same amount. And I think that when the ones that were hired last got that first denarius, I think that the people that were hired first were probably thinking, oh, this is good. If they're getting paid that now, he must have just been making a mistake. He must, he must have something really big for us because, you know, this only makes sense. And as they're starting to see that they're all getting paid the exact same, they start to get angry. What is this? Why are we getting paid the same amount? Same pay for different hours. It's not fair, Right? Everyone gets a card. That's not fair. It's fair to me, but if, I, if my birthday was in July, it would not be fair, <laughs> right? It's just not fair. Everyone who serves the Lord will be treated fairly, though. Workers, those workers got either what they were agreed upon getting or they got more. They either got what they agreed to do or they got more. Unless we see God and accept his grace, we cannot worship him. We cannot understand grace unless we want it for everybody, right? That's the picture of God that we have to be able to see in order to truly worship him. We can't just have this grace and not want it for everybody. We have to see that grace and want that grace for everybody, the story of Jonah is one that shows me this the most. I was reading Jonah this week, and I, it, it just makes me laugh. I mean, if you just read it, it's a very short, short story, and it will it'll make you laugh if you really think about it. 
Because Jonah is called by God, he is a prophet of God, and God asks him to go to Nineveh, right? And to, to preach, to tell them that he is going to destroy them in 40 days because of how wicked they are. And he asked Jonah, you need to go and you need to tell them this. You need to, you need to preach to these people. And then it's almost like how Paxton is right now where if I say, don't go to the stairs, he goes to the stairs. You know what I'm saying? If I say, don't go in the bathroom, he's like, he looks at me and just walks into the bathroom, you know? And it's, it's defiant. I don't care if there are only one. It's like, his, the look on his face, he knows what he's doing. It's just like, I will go to this bathroom, and you will come and get me, you know? Like, and that's exactly what happens. Uh, that's exactly what happens here. I mean, God says, Jonah, go. Go to Nineveh. And Jonah's just like, I will go to Tarshish, you know? Like, and he goes and he gets on that boat for Tarshish, and he's, he's not obeying God, Right? And we know the story. We know what happens. The storm comes, and then they decide to throw him overboard, and then they think they're done with that, and Jonah probably thinks he's done with life, right? And then this whale or fish or whatever it was swallows him, right? And he's praying in there, and then God spits him up onto the shore, and then he ends up in Nineveh, right? Which makes me remember that... There's not really a point in disobeying God because he's going to get you there either way. And it's less messy if you can avoid the fish belly. But, you know, do whatever you want to do, I guess. Uh, but, but he ends up there, right? And we know how that story goes. But I think it's more interesting what happens at the end of the story. Because, because what has happened is he ends up in Nineveh where God wanted him to be. And he's going to tell these people that in 40 days, God's going to destroy them, right? And so he starts to tell them about this. And guess what? Their hearts start to soften. And the king finally convinces all these people, this large city, he convinces them that they need to just fast and pray. And in, in fact, he needs to have them not feed their animals. Animals are fasting and praying. I mean, this is extreme, right? And they are praying that God would spare them their lives, and so then in Jonah 3.10, it says this, God saw what they had done, that they had turned from their evil lives, and he changed his mind about them. He said that he would not do to them what he said he would do. Is that not crazy? And we're not going to get into the idea of changing God's mind this morning because we just don't have the time. <laughs> But it's crazy that God all of a sudden just decides this is not what he's going to do because these people have really repented. They're really repentant. But what's even crazier than that is Jonah's response. Jonah has a prayer to God in chapter 4 that is really unforgettable, and I love it in the Message Bible. It says, God, I knew it. When I was back home, I knew this was going to happen. That's why I ran off to Tarshish. I knew you were sheer grace and mercy, not easily angered, rich in love, and ready at the drop of a hat to turn your plans of punishment into a program of forgiveness. So God, if you won't kill them, then kill me. Jonah's just like, somebody's just got to die around here, okay? <laughs> and I'm ready. Just sign me up. If you won't kill them, kill me. I'm better off dead. And then God's response is, what do you have to be angry about? <laughs> and that's kind of my question <laughs> to Jonah at this point. What do you have to be angry about, Jonah? Jonah, you should be worshiping God at this point like crazy, I mean, he should be praising and worshiping God. This is a success story like nobody's business. God asks him to do something, and he runs away, jumps on a boat to somewhere else. The storm comes, and he's thrown into the watery depths thinking he's going to die, and God sends a whale to save his life, right? I mean, this should be a moment of celebration. Then he gets to Nineveh, and he preaches to these people, and their hearts are turned, 
success. We're not talking about a small little city. We're not talking about like you can drive right through it and you're done. I mean, this is a city of over 100,000 people, Nineveh. Asheville has over 80,000, something like that, just over 80,000. I mean, this is bigger than Asheville, and I don't think we could do half that this afternoon, all of us trying, you know, to get everyone to not eat with all the restaurants we have. I mean, it's just not going to happen, right? <laughs> and the animals, these people love their dogs in Asheville. We're definitely not getting them to not eat. They, they eat before the people around here. So, so this idea that he could do all of this, it should be a moment of rejoicing, a moment of worship, worshiping God for the grace that he has extended. It's a success. But no, Jonah doesn't see it that way. He's mad. Jonah is mad because God did exactly what he knew he was going to do. He extended undeserved grace. Maybe he'd forgotten that he was, just came out of the belly of a whale. But these were bad people in Jonah's mind. They were the Assyrians. They were not a non-hostile Gentile nation. They were active enemies of Israel. But even a prophet of God a man seeking God, a man that God is using to do his plan, even a prophet of God, unless he sees God and accepts his grace, cannot worship him. So he doesn't. That's not his response. I'm not talking about physically seeing God. I'm talking about getting it. Do you know what I mean by getting it? getting who he is and what he's done and what he is doing, understanding this grace. When we get it, when you get it, you will worship. When we get it, we will worship. When we understand that grace, it is natural for us to worship. But Jonah is a walking contradiction. He wants to be, he wants grace for himself and he wants justice for them, right? He doesn't want the same things. They didn't deserve it, Jonah says. Jonah's thinking, they don't deserve it. But neither did you, Jonah. Neither did you, right? They're so disobedient. They're running from God. Mm, that's interesting, Jonah. I think you did that exact same thing <laughs> on a boat just a little while ago. I don't know if you remember. But that's not just it. He's saying, and then all they did is pray, and then you forgive them, and you hear them, and you rescue them, right? Exactly what has just happened to Jonah, right? Unless we see God, we cannot worship him. What does that mean? Worship is our natural reaction to God's character and God's grace in our life as he extends it to us. God extends grace and we respond in worship. God extends grace, we respond in worship. God extends grace, we respond in worship. But only if we see God for who he really is. Otherwise, it's just going through the motions. Until we get it, God's going to keep extending grace and we're going to keep pretending worship. Until we get it, until we really understand this grace, and we want it for not just ourselves, but we truly want everyone to get a card. Until we get it like that, then God's, God's grace isn't, isn't stopped being extended. It's continually extended, but our grace, but our worship is easily pretended, right? It's easy for us to just go to the, through the motions sometimes. Here at Foster, we can see God. That's the, that's the exciting part. Because unless we see God, we cannot worship him. We can see God. We can see God through the life of Jesus. In him, we see the grace like nobody's business. We see grace extended to the righteous and the unrighteous. We see him extend grace in his life to the Jews and to the Gentiles. Right? 
We see him extending grace, not just to his close personal believers and the people that followed him, but we see him extending grace over and over again to the selfish people, to the murderers, to the prostitutes, and to the thieves. He extends grace, and we can see God. Isn't that exciting? Hired first, hired second, hired third, hired last. Fourth and last, I guess. It doesn't really matter. Your reward is always amazing. Birthday or not, everybody gets a card. Is it fair? No, it's not fair. It doesn't sound fair to me, not in my understanding of fair. It's probably not really fair in your understanding of fair. And to that, I say praise God. Grace from the beginning and grace to the end. If this morning you're not really feeling worship, if maybe in your life you don't really feel like worshiping God day to day in your homes by yourselves, maybe it's hard for you to worship, maybe it just doesn't feel real to you, maybe you feel like you don't really know how to worship God. If you're stuck, if you feel stuck, I don't invite you to work on your worship. I invite you to see God. Because in seeing God and seeing that grace, you will react and respond in worship whether you really want to or not. It's going to happen because you really get it. And so this morning, I invite you to really get it, to really feel God and let him react, react to that. Seeing God as he is and remembering what he has done brings us to a place of total praise and worship that far extends the boundaries of this campus into every, every part of our lives. Everyone gets a card. See God for who he truly is, and then true worship will happen. Let's pray. God, thank you for the stories in the Bible that remind us that we're not the only ones that have a hard time really seeing you, really understanding your grace, really wanting grace for others besides ourselves. It's in the stories of Jonah, your prophet, that I'm encouraged because I realize that we're all in this same struggle together. And God, I just ask that we can really see a better picture of who you are, understand your grace more and more so that we can better worship you, that it will be a reaction to our relationship with you. So continue to reveal that to us and continue to help us extend grace in that same way to others. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. There is a meal today. Some people thought there wasn't, but there is. So join us down there.